All right, so McInerney, chapter one of uh, Ethica Thomistica. What did you all think? Any, um, any overall thoughts? Uh, what did you think of the text? Any questions you might have? Way better to read than the last text. Okay. I found it way simpler. I thought I could grasp the, con grasp the concepts even better in this text than C.S. Lewis. Okay, good, good. Anybody, anybody have the same or, or an opposite experience? I get to read it, I'm sorry. Oh, well, get on that. Yeah. Next time. Anybody who did read it have, have did anybody have trouble with it? Let me ask that. Good, good. I have gotten some mixed responses. Some people did find this a little bit more difficult. Um, and, and I think that it's, it's primarily a stylistic difference, really. Right? It's that the, uh, the previous texts, what we've read from C.S. Lewis, are, like I keep mentioning, very hermeneutic. They're very circular. He goes back through the same topics, just sort of covering it in a slightly different way each time. And so I have at least found that, that really, that's a very conversational kind of writing style. And so it's really easy to figure out, it's really easy to follow along if you're just sort of reading through it like you'd read a novel, or if you're just sort of listening to it like you'd listen to a podcast or a conversation. Whereas what McInerney is doing is much more like a sort of academic textbook. He's going through section by section and saying, here's my argument, here's an example for that argument, here's how it leads into the next example, and then just sort of going through in, in a relatively organized order. So I think that that does, that I think lends itself more to a careful analysis rather than just sort of kind of following along vaguely with what Lewis might have to say. I had trouble reading the last one because as you said, it sounds better to listen to. That's true. I could, listening and reading. Yeah, and that's, a lot of that is just a difference between sort of learning styles, right? Which, I mean, yeah, I, th I, th I think that, um, there's certainly a benefit to, uh, to Lewis's writing style, um, and especially because it was, it was delivered as a spoken address to a popular audience as well. Uh, whereas this is, this is very much a textbook. Right? This, is, this is a straightforward argument for conclusions that, that goes step by step. Uh, now, that isn't to say that he doesn't start with a point and then kind of come back to it later, because he does that a few times as well, but not nearly to the same degree or in the same way. Uh, something else that I'll note on sort of McInerney's style, I love his writing style. I, I really enjoy, uh, I enjoy his writing. And a lot of that is because of the sort of the richness of his examples. That every example he gives is just, it sticks in your memory, at least in mine, because he includes just so much detail. And in a lot of cases, unnecessary detail. And I think that there's a couple of reasons for that. Now this is speculative. I don't. I don't know the guy, um, so I don't exactly know if this is uh, this is why he he writes the way that he does. But um, a couple of reasons I would think of to write using these kinds of really rich, detailed, in some cases really wacky examples. Um, one, to give new light to it, right? Because a lot of what he's talking about is just really, really standard ethical thought experiments that are like ages old. Like nothing he's saying here is particularly new, uh, or even like all that brilliantly insightful. Uh, now this was written 40, 40 ish years ago. This was nineteen eighty two when this was first published. Um, but even since then, like you, you, his examples are more or less applicable to now, and they would have been more or less applicable just maybe using different using different details. Obviously, you know, several hundred years ago. Um, but I want to read a passage, a little bit of a passage from the preface, which I find to be particularly relevant to what I'm saying here. So he says, uh, this is right here in the middle paragraph here. I gave a series of four lectures which were meant to convey what any fool knows about Thomistic ethics. To my surprise, almost to my consternation, what I said was regarded as innovative and original. Once I had satisfied myself that such charges were unfounded, I wondered why they had been made. So he basically gives a talk, which is the basis of this book, gives a few talks and says, here are all the really basic things about this ethical system that, that kind of everybody who knows much about the subject matter should already know and should be relatively straightforward and not surprising or anything like that. And then the audience went, wow, you've come up with some brilliant new ideas. I would have never thought of things like that. And then he was distraught because that wasn't his intention. 
Right, his intention certainly was not to come up with brilliant new ideas. It was to retell age-old ideas in a relatively straightforward and comprehensible way, which is what his goal is throughout the rest of the, uh, or the, rest of the book as well. Right? So his examples of like the guy sitting down for breakfast and eating a bowl of carpet tacks, that's a really standard way of conveying the difference between criticizing means and criticizing ends. The difference, though, is that he adds a whole bunch of unnecessary detail, very colorful language, and a bunch of puns. And so it kind of sticks, at least to me. So that's part of it. I think that is part of why he, why he includes this. Like The car example, the flat tire example. What was the lady's name? Does anyone remember? The lady who stopped to help him? Fifi. Right? Fifi LaRue. Sounds like something out of like a 1920s detective comic book or something, right? This is, this is, his examples are almost cartoonish, but they're also realistic to a degree. Right? I mean, it's not quite realistic that, you know, someone would be eating a bowl of carpet tacks with milk and sugar, but if someone were to do that, the situation would go roughly as, as detailed. Like, whoa, what are you doing? Uh, my doctor said I need more iron in my diet. <laughs> um, that's definitely not what he meant. Whereas somebody else might be, you know, sullenly eating, going up to eat a bowl of carpet tacks, and then somebody says, whoa, whoa, what are you doing? Uh, don't want to live anymore, right? Which is his other example, right? That's his other version of this. He says, uh, I, I love this little part. Sure. Now, I might have responded to your question by saying that I wish to shuffle off this mortal coil and the internal hemorrhaging promised by the consumption of a bowl of carpet tacks seems a good way to achieve my end. And end here, did you get the pun? End as in goal and then end as in also death. That is brilliant. And it just, it's colorful. Now the other part of this, the other reason why I think he writes, I think he writes in this kind of like really, really vivid examples is because all of these superfluous unnecessary details are how life actually is. You'll often find ethical thought experiments which are dry, which are only about what it's about. It only gives you the details that are morally significant and relevant to the ethical judgment at hand. But you will never find yourself in a situation where the only details are the morally relevant ones, ever. It doesn't happen like that. That's not how life works, right? When you, when you find yourself in a situation of getting a flat tire and all of this wackiness happening, Yes, that's life. Indeed it is. The Cubs lose 11 to 0. Yes, well, in life, the Cubs will lose 11 to 0. That's, or maybe not exactly that score, but they'll lose. That's how things work, right? That was intended as a joke, sorry. Um, but the score of the game that you intended to go see is going to be something. And while no, that's not relevant at all, it's good to remember that the world is still going on around you. And there are details to these events, even if they don't really matter to the ethics of the situation. It doesn't really matter how the game went to whether, uh, you know, whether his wife blames him for this, for this chance occurrence or how they, wind up, uh, how they wind up conceiving their next child or whatever, right? All of these little details are absolutely superfluous, but it treats the situations like they're real rather than as, as if they're just purely thought experiments. I think this is very relevant to how we do and how we should do ethics, right? thinking about these kinds of situations. Because again, I, I, I've said this before, figuring out the ethics of a situation or the morality of a situation involves sort of three steps of the process. First is looking at the abstract principles involved. What is right and wrong? Why should we pursue it? What is it exactly that should, we should be pursuing? sort of in the really broad abstract sense. This is, this is the, the a priori abstract principles. But then you narrow things down and you look at the, the fine-grained details of a particular situation. And you try and figure out how these broad abstract principles apply to the concrete details of the situation. But in order to do that, you have to know all of the details of the situation as best you can. And that's, where, well, that's why we're doing these case analyses, right? Is, is looking at the precise details of the situation, trying to figure out what's relevant and how it's relevant to our abstract principles and how that might apply to the concrete case. It's easy to go wildly abstract and just say, you know, 
say that there are no additional details in an ethical case. We are just talking about, uh, say, um, you know, to use the, the way too tired ethical example, uh, the trolley problem, right, where the question of whether someone is, uh, is right or wrong in pulling the lever of uh, the trolley car. Have I used this example in, in, in this class yet? Are you familiar with this case? Yeah. Anybody else? Vaguely? The trolley problem? Yes. Okay. It, I, it's, did the, I did the website polygon. I prefer to uh, drift it on both tracks. OK, well, multi track drifting is technically an option, but that is uh, rather counterproductive depending on what that you're trying to do. Cool. I mean, fair enough. But so this, is, this provides, I think, a good contrast point to what McInerney's trying to do, right? So as stated, usually the trolley problem is something like you find yourself as an innocent bystander near a runaway trolley. You find yourself near enough to the switch that can switch the tracks from one to the other. And you find that this runaway trolley is heading towards five people trapped on the tracks. And you could flip the switch and divert it towards the one person trapped on the other track. Do you flip the switch, condemning this person to death, or do you leave it alone and allow these five people to die? This is really useful, kind of, because it illustrates the difference between certain different abstract principles that we could, have, that we could apply in the given situation. Like on the one hand, if utility or outcomes or consequences is what we're looking for, flipping the switch means that one person dies. Not flipping the switch means that five people die. You should flip the switch because it's going to produce better outcomes, less people dying. However, there's also another thing that this can illustrate, which is directly killing someone versus allowing people to die, which are radically different things from, from again, any comprehensible ethical standpoint. Yeah? Isn't allowing five people to die still directly killing them? No. Like, you have the choice. I'm allowing people to die right now. Yeah, but if you don't vote, you, 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 like, you have the choice to either kill one person or kill five. The choice is they no. without my responsibility. That's true. Right. I am right now allowing people to die. Right now. You know how? Well, yes, technically. Exactly, right? I could good example. There is another philosophy professor at this very university religion more than philosophy, but regardless, religion philosophy professor at this very university who is a volunteer firefighter. He saves people's lives all the time. I don't do that. I ho apparently I could, and I've chosen to do other things with my life and therefore allowed people to die. So have I allowed people to die or have I actively killed them by allowing them to burn to death in their, house, in their homes or in their offices or whatnot? Okay, but in the instance of the firefighter, uh -huh. Uh -huh. If he had the choice to save a family of five in one apartment mm -hmm. and a single person in another apartment. No, I have a counterpoint. Mm -hmm. There's supposed to be more than one firefighter. There probably should be, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's actually a good point. Under most circumstances, usually everyone being saved is an option. It's on the table. Here is explicitly not purely based on how the scenario is set up. It is set up in such a way as to present a stark moral choice, even though such things are ridiculously uncommon in real life. You'll almost never encounter a situation where the only options are one person dies versus five people die. It's going to be more like, how can, is it possible to save everyone, and who are we going to be able to save, and who are we not? So think about the burning building scenario. It's not so much, do we go into this apartment and save somebody, or do we go into this apartment and save five people? It's more like, what are the risks involved in, in trying to save this person versus what are the risks involved in trying to save these people? And if trying to do both, can we accomplish both, or can we only accomplish one? How can we accomplish one or the other? Which one's going to present more risk? All of these factors are going to come into play here, and it's not just going to be flip a switch. Here's another problem with a scenario like this. Who are these people? No one here. They're generic non-player characters. Look, they have exactly the same face. <laughs> That's not how the world works at all. There's no such thing as a generic human being. Right? I'm not. You're not. All of those various people around us are not. Each one of those six people, seven people, including the guy with the switch, is an individual person. 
So the choice is not kill one, or kill one person or allow five people to die. It's kill this person or allow these five people to die. It's not a number, it's not a one versus five thing. It's a this person versus these people kind of thing. Right? And again, that winds up being important. So why I, why I bring this up is in contrast to McInerney, because ethicists tend to like situations like this. No, not, not, <laughs> oh, <whoa. laughs> hold on. Phrasing, phrasing. Phrasing. Um, I mean, I'm perfectly fine saying that because I don't like scenarios like this, even, even in the abstract. But what I don't mean by that is we, we like tying people to railroad tracks and seeing what happens and seeing what people decide. Um, as far as I know, ethicists don't tend to do that. Um, there might be exceptions, in, mostly in Canada. But um, I'll explain what that means at some point. But for now, let that just sort of hang over your head. Um, in any case, though, philosophers in general prefer situations where everything is uh, thought experiments, where everything is clean and delineated, where, where we can get abstract answers to abstract questions without getting into the specifics. The trouble is, in ethical scenarios, there will always be specific details. There will always be someone who's not just variables, but precise circumstances, confounding circumstances, uncontrolled variables, if you want to think about it in a scientific sense. Right? And not just uncontrolled variables that are accounted for in the experiment. There will be circumstances that occur that alter and change things. Right? There is no such thing as a controlled case, a, uh, a, a you know, you can't conduct double-blind ethical studies. Not anymore. Um, I say not anymore because ethics boards exist now in most universities, basically all universities. Um, that's actually going to be uh, something we're going to talk about later on is uh, Milgram experiments, which I mentioned. Um, that was part of the reason why ethics boards exist now, is because that was a horrendously unethical experiment to conduct for various reasons that we'll get to. All that aside, why this is so different is that a case like this illustrates broad ethical principles quite well, but it doesn't actually tell us anything about particular cases. It doesn't help us uh, figure out what to do in any given scenario because that's not a particular scenario. This is an abstracted test case. It's not actually something that could or would happen because it doesn't have the level of detail that a real, a real case does. By contrast, if we look at McInerney's cases, all of, his, all of his examples, every single one of them, has the detail that you would find in real life. What's the difference, from an ethical standpoint, of eating carpet tax plain versus with milk and sugar? Nothing, really. I don't think. <clears throat> I don't think there's a real difference there. But he takes the time to say, before me is a bowl of carpet tax. I pour milk on them, sprinkle sugar over them, and bring a heaping spoonful towards my mouth. So what? What's the point of that? Well, it's because a real scenario is going to be a real scenario. There's going to be details in any real, any, any real case. And so that's why he's, he's very careful to outline details, uh, even if they're maybe outlandish. Right? Bowl full of carpet tax is outlandish, obviously. The, the golfing example where a robin's egg lands on somebody's head and leads him to strike someone with his golf club, outlandish, but again, it's the kind of thing that might happen in a very precise, careful case, which is what these case studies, these, these sort of ethical thought experiments are meant to do anyway. But the fact that they have these minute little details means that we have to consider them in thinking about the ethics of the situation. All right, what else? Any other, anything else, any general thoughts or any, um, anything in particular here that we want to look at or any questions that you might have uh, about this first chapter? I like the idea of him saying how different morals apply to different people simply based on perspective. How so? Where was this? Do you have a... Um, Just page five, yeah. Five. 
um, basically one person can be appraised for moral actions that they don't really believe are justifiably moral to them. Mm -hmm. There is no such thing as like a good and bad human moral according to each human based on their own. At least that's how I interpret it. Well, what does it mean exactly? Elaborate, because I'm not, I'm, I'm concerned you might be getting it backwards, but I'm not sure. So go on. You might be on. You might be perfectly on track. I'm not. I'm just not sure exactly. So what do you mean exactly? Like so, how every human has their own morals, but they're not justifiably moral because it's not moral to somebody else. So let me let me explain what I take this to mean and see if see if we're on the on the same page or somewhere else. Um, so in this section here, when he's when he's outlining this difference, or what he's after in this section is the question of why act morally at all and why act by uh, certain universal standards. So what, he's, what he winds up saying is that we are always necessarily acting morally. We're making moral choices, morally significant choices, things that matter. But that, that when we do that, what that winds up meaning is that we are always trying to do good by necessity. I'll look at, we'll look at why that is exactly, but because we're always necessarily acting already to be good, to do something right, to do something good, uh, to achieve some goal that we find, we find worth doing, what that necessarily means is no matter, whether, no matter whether you are following morality, objectively speaking, or not, you're trying to act morally. So different people might be acting differently, some people might be doing good, some people might be doing bad, but they're all trying to do good. And so why we judge morally, why we judge ethics, why we do ethics at all, is because everybody has this goal in mind. And so it's not like you're applying some alien standard, right? some, some standard that is outside any particular human action. What you're doing is you're applying the standard people are already assuming. We're just trying to apply it correctly. How's that track? See, I didn't say that at all, but that makes okay. sense. Okay. All right. Good that that makes sense, at least. There we go. So uh, let, me, let me go ahead and make a couple of distinctions here that he, that he tries to draw in, in this little section, because I think it'll be helpful to sort of illustrate what he's talking about. Um, so one of these is between what he says, what he calls actions which aren't moral one or moral in the first sense and moral two, or moral in the second sense, or let's say in the broad sense versus in the narrow sense. So something is moral one, moral in the broad sense, if it is a human action. And therefore, if it is a human action, it is subject to uh, moral judgment. Now we'll look at exactly what makes a, a human action and why it's subject to moral judgment, et cetera. Uh, but the moral two, the moral in the second sense, is a human action which is good, right? It's a good action. To say that something is moral, to say that something is a moral decision or a moral choice, we can mean that in two ways. We can mean that what you are doing is you're making a choice which has moral character to it that it is subject to moral judgment. But then we can also say that by making a moral decision, what you're doing is the right thing. You're making the right moral, moral decision. You're acting morally. These are significantly different. They wind up being uh, significantly different. Now, what delineates a human action in this sense? It has to have three, um, three traits. Uh, this you'll find right at like, the first chapter, right, right at the right first like paragraph of the chapter, sorry. Uh, it has to be conscious. It has to be deliberate. And it has to be free. All of these admit of degrees. So th something can be more, more or less conscious, more or less deliberate, or more or less free. If it is more of each of these, then it is more 
moral. It's more, more subject to moral judgment. It is more properly called an action and less properly called an event, just something that occurs. The difference between a human action and something that just sort of happens is the difference between something that you do and something that happens to you. And so what are these categorizations? What are these requirements? So for something to be conscious, for an action to be conscious, you need to be aware of yourself and the character of the action. You need to be aware of your choosing it, your, your own doing it, and you also need to be aware of what the action is. So you need to be, first of all, aware of yourself. In other words, you need to be conscious in the ordinary sense, not sleeping. Right? This is why we're not morally responsible for things that happen when we're sleepwalking at all. That sort of thing is not conscious, and therefore it's not action. It's not something that you do. Right? So if you just, you, a friend of mine, uh, another philosopher friend of mine, uh, sleepwalks sometimes. And um, he will occasionally just sleepwalk to the kitchen, make something to eat, eat it, and go back to bed without waking up. Some of the time, uh, well, you can imagine a scenario in which he does so, but he does something which maybe he eats something that belongs to a roommate or a friend who left it at his house. He wouldn't be blameworthy for that because he didn't do it. Now maybe he could have acted beforehand to prevent it from happening, like locking it up somewhere or hiding it where he wasn't aware of it somehow, but that's a little bit difficult because he's also still sort of at least in a dreamlike state, aware of what he's doing. So that would be very difficult to do. He knows that this is very difficult to do. He's tried this sort of thing before. But in a case like that, he's obviously not aware of what he's doing, and so he's not responsible for what he, quote, did, because he didn't actually do it. It wasn't his action. It was just something that occurred. He happened to be, his body happened to be involved in it happening. But it wasn't his, his conscious, deliberate, or free choice. This can also apply to things like, um, like uh, impairment due to drugs or alcohol, that sort of thing. So if you're blackout drunk, you're not conscious of what you're doing. And so you're not doing it. Now, that has a caveat to it. Because you're not immediately no longer culpable for things that happen when you're drunk. Because at least in most cases, you did decide consciously, deliberately, and freely to get blackout drunk. And so there is, a, there is a sense in which you sort of rolled the dice on what might happen and understood that those consequences might be very dire. Right? So if you get blackout drunk and you don't take due precautions, whether or not you actually get behind the wheel of a car, you still did something wrong because you perfectly well might have for all you knew. OK, so in addition to this, consciousness is also conscious of the action being carried out. Good example from, uh, from my own life, a personal example. Um, suppose, a, uh, suppose a child, young child, still learning to read, were to happen across a lever on the wall that says pull. What do you do if you are said child? Reasonable decision. What might happen after that? It drops something. Like maybe this lever is on a stage or like back stage. OK, OK. So it's like it opens a trap door in the stage floor, and an actor unexpectedly falls through and injures himself. OK. Was the child responsible for doing that? No. Why not? The child wasn't supervised. OK, but so what? So was Lever. So what? So somebody should have been watching it to make sure nobody accidentally pulled it. Ah, accidentally pulled it. That's crucial. Yes. Right. So we would say that this was done accidentally because the child in this scenario did not know what the lever did. He just knew that pull. That's it. The child understood this action as pulling a lever that says pull. The child did not understand this action as opening the trap door on the stage. Or in my case, starting the fire alarm. I did this when I was in kindergarten. The lever on the wall said pull. Now, it also said, in case of emergencies. But that was small text. And you, every, if you know about children learning to read, you learn to le read big letters before you learn to read little letters. So I read pull, and I went, pull. And then the building got evacuated. I had a stern talking to from the principal. Now, it was 
it wasn't my fault, right? I, at the time, was, I, what I was doing, I understood as pulling a lever that said pull. Now, if I'm being overly charitable to myself, you might even describe my actions as following instructions. Now, that's a, that's a stupid excuse, and that was, that was how I tried to get away with this. But um, I was trying desperately to get out of trouble for this. <laughs> um, but I really genuinely did not know what it would do. I just saw that it said pull, and I, realized, I thought, pull I'll pull it, right? Because it says to pull, so that seems normal and reasonable. Why would it be in the reach of a small child if it were not meant to be pulled? So I was, what, like five or six, something like that. Um, or the trap door example. Right? Why was there a kid wandering around backstage during a play or during a rehearsal or whatever? Maybe there was a good reason, maybe there was not, setting all that aside. Maybe that's something else to consider. But in a case like this, right, the action that the, the child in this case was conscious of doing was pulling a lever that said pull, not starting a fire alarm, not opening a trap door. Now, if they did it twice, then the second time would be a completely different action than the first time. So if I had come back to school the next day and ran up to the fire alarm and pulled it, then I would have pulled the fire alarm. The first time I did not pull the fire alarm. I pulled a lever that said pull. The second time, having known what the thing did, if I ran up to it and pulled the thing, then I pulled the fire alarm. I was responsible for pulling the fire alarm, not just for pulling a lever. So the consciousness of the action, of what the action is doing, is crucially important to, to moral faults, to culpability. Same goes with deliberation. So deliberation is the act of ends means reasoning. So deciding on a particular end, what you're trying to achieve, and then deciding on the means to achieve it. Thinking this through and acting upon it. This can be to any degree. This does not have to be thoroughly considered. Right? So he talks about golfing. Right? So he talks about the, the golf example. The guy who drives a golf ball 200 yards and it hits somebody in the head. Right. Okay, so fine, but his act of deliberation was to hit the golf ball a certain distance. Now that may have been very elaborate. He may be a very good golfer, and since the, the green was 200 yards away, maybe he deliberated, chose a particular club, uh, compensated for the wind, picked a direction, uh, drove at a particular strength to get it a certain distance. And then someone drove out in front of the ball and got struck in the head by it. Okay. It may have been a lot less deliberate. He may have been just, you know, trying to get it as far as he could, so he took his one wood and, and just wailed at it. Because, man, that green is very far away and I need to make as much distance as I can, so he just deliberated and decided that I need to get this, bar, this ball as far as I can. That means I need to take my heaviest club and hit it as hard as I possibly can. And then somebody drove out in front of it and got hit in the head by it. Either way, hitting someone in the head with the golf ball was not his end. That was not what he was aiming, toward, aiming for, and that was not part of, his, um, part of his means for achieving that end. Now, uh, maybe a contrary example of this might be cruelly, perhaps. Suppose he sees the guy who drives, drives, onto the park, drives onto the golf course and he sees him stop. And he says, he says to his buddy who he's golfing with, he says, hey, bet I can't hit him in the head. And he whacks the ball, he knocks the guy in the head, and the guy dies, as in the scenario. That's what happens in this case, in the case McInerney describes. In that case, he absolutely did deliberately hit the guy. Now, maybe he didn't think he could accomplish it, but he was still trying to. And that was still, it was still wrong of him. Now, whether or not he actually managed to hit the guy, it still would have been wrong of him to try to. And to achieve that end, he arranged certain means and tried to accomplish it. My mind is drawn to Happy Gilmore. Yes. <laughs> There's literally an example of this. I bet you can't get that ball into that window and then it hits the old lady twice. Holy. Come on, like that, that was deliberate. That was absolutely deliberate. Uh, now, whether he thought he actually could or not, because at that point in the movie, it was very clear that he didn't think he could. He still did it, 
not once but twice, and therefore the second time absolutely should have known that he was going to be able to do it. Hit that guy! He shouldn't have been standing there. See, the first time, he was not fully conscious of being able to, but he was deliberately trying to hit her. If you don't remember this scene? Yeah. Anybody? Never seen it. Oh, it's a good movie. It's, it's when what Adam Sandler was really funny. Uh, repo people taking all the stuff out of the house, or? No, this was just a random lady down the street. It was, with the, it was when the repo people were taking yeah, the stuff out of the house. Yeah, they were, yeah. couldn't do it. Right. And they didn't think he could do it, he didn't think he could do it, so he tried to do it anyway. But trying to do it anyway still is deliberation. He was still attempting to do it, and he was freely choosing to. And then, so he wasn't necessarily conscious of being able to hit, to hit the old lady in the window. And he wasn't conscious that she was there exactly. So he wasn't fully responsible the first time. He was very responsible, but maybe, maybe not completely. Again, like I said, all of these admit of degrees. The second time, he was definitely conscious of his ability to do it, conscious of her location there, and deliberately trying to hit her, and then freely chose to do it anyway. One more time, double or nothing. You better pay up. Like Adam Sandler, or an Adam Sandler character, probably. Let's maybe not, maybe let, maybe let's not maybe be too mean to the actor. So, now, that's, it. that's if it's the end. What if it's the means? We can also take an example from Happy Gilmore, modified slightly. If you remember the end when he, like, he, it, where everything falls and crashes on the green and he hits the ball and it bounces off a whole bunch of stuff and goes loop-de-loop -loop and swirl like a mini golf course and then gets into the hole, right? So that whole thing, what if he had decided that someone's head would need to be one of the things it needs to bounce off of? I could see that happening in the movie. It didn't, but I could see it happening in the movie. So in a case like that, yes, fine, his end, his goal was not hitting somebody in the head with a golf ball, but it was still deliberate. He still intended to do it as a means for getting the ball into the hole, and so he still would be morally responsible for doing it. It would still be deliberate in that case. Now, freedom here, again, just means that your options are not overly constrained, right? So, like, trolley problem, if that were a possible real-world scenario, you're not fully free insofar as you're not capable of killing no one. You're not capable of saving everybody, as outlined by the scenario, right? And so, your options are constrained. You're not fully free, and so you're only morally responsible for, for doing what you're free to do. So you're not responsible for not saving anybody, because, not, not saving everybody, because that's impossible. You couldn't, you couldn't have done it. This also applies to things like coercion, right, or acting under duress. Like if somebody is threatening you, you're not nearly as morally responsible as if you chose to do it, you know, without that kind of um, that kind of enforcement or something like that. Okay. So with all that in mind, he points out that. All, all of our actions, every human action that fulfills those three requirements, every action which is conscious, deliberate, and free, is a moral action in this first sense. In other words, it is subject to moral judgment. Absolutely everything that we actually do is subject to moral judgment. This is a fairly controversial claim because it seems like there's lots of things that we do which are morally insignificant, or at least morally neutral. I have water in here. Is it good or bad? Or neither. Was that right, right of me or wrong of me to fill this with water? Why did you do so for yourself? What do you mean for myself? In order to properly nurture yourself, you hydrated yourself. 
yourself by grabbing water. Okay, so that's one factor to consider. I think you're right insofar as, insofar as it goes, but that doesn't go too far. Right? Clearly, I had an end in mind. I was, I was getting water, filling it up, so that I can stay hydrated. It's a good one. That's a good end in itself. Now, there's a lot more to it than that. Part of why I want to stay hydrated at this very moment is so that I can talk clearly and coherently for you guys. Right? Because if I don't have a drink in front of me, there's a good chance that I'm going to like stop and have to clear my throat a lot more. Or, or my voice get, might get odd, having already spoken for you know three hours today. We might also say that, well, yes, I chose to fill this with water, but what were the alternatives? Could I have done otherwise? And what could I have done otherwise? Buy soda or coffee. Could have gone and gotten a soda. Right? Now, that has detriments. If I were to do this every day, every Tuesday and Thursday at this time, that has a couple of detriments to it. One, a soda every day is not the most healthy thing in the world, especially combined with other things and other habits and whatnot. Um, it's also uh, that you know, costs can add up eventually, rather than the cost of water, which is time. It cost me walking across the hallway, and that's about it, right? Which is, which is a very, diff very big difference from, I don't know, paying, what is it, a buck fifty for a bottle of soda or whatever. Good lord. Three fifty, I'm already in. No, three twenty-five. Seven dollars in my door. Jesus. Okay. Well, two dollars across from the apartment in in the one of the three twenty-five. Back in my day, you could buy a soda bottle for a dollar. Oh, and the worst part is. I'm actually I'm serious about that. Like when oh, I was yeah. when I was in college, which was not long ago, by the way. You could put a dollar into a machine and get a get a. Or whatever soda bottle. Well, I know it used to be a dollar seventy-five last semester. Jesus. Inflation, man. Yeah, the worst part about that vending machine is it charges you double before because it's a penny transaction, but it charges you double. So uh, oh, I have back, multiple back pays. Yeah, back pays. Oh god, okay, that's horrible. I have multiple six fifty pendings. That's ridiculous. Anyway, water is a preferable alternative. Now, what about coffee? Coffee doesn't have those same, all of those same problems. But also, on the downside, as you may know, there's no working coffee maker that I am aware of in this building, or at least this floor. I need to explore some more and find out, find out if I can you know, bum coffee off of somebody else, which means that I would either have to find somewhere else in the building that has a working coffee maker or leave the building and risk being late for class, which I have an obligation not to do. So if we look at me getting water, that has good. That is a good end in itself, keeping hydrated. That end is conducive to other ends, which I'm also pursuing for good reasons, being able to talk coherently, comfortably. And also, uh, some of the various alternative means of hydration are dispreferable. They would have more detriments to them, despite the benefits, right? Having coffee would have the benefit of providing me with caffeine, which you know, given my crippling addiction, is probably a good thing in the immediate circumstances. I, I both went to grad school and had kids. It happens. You, you will get a caffeine addiction if you do either of those things, especially if you do At both. Point, just go through high school. That's fair. I, I mean, have I, have I, I don't know if I've given this example or talked about this before, but I had a, I had a professor in college who, um, an ethics, oh, an ethics, the ethics teacher, maybe? Who, uh, who was shocked to see all of us undergraduates just chugging coffee yeah. by the gallon. And oh, I thought you were talking about the one teacher that would like, drink so many cups of coffee. Oh, no, no, different teacher, different guy, oh. different guy. Um, no, this was a professor in college who, who was shocked, just utterly baffled by seeing all of us undergraduates, all of us carefree little 18 to 21 year olds drinking gallons of coffee at a time, just chugging it through, mid, through midday. Um, and because he didn't start drinking coffee until he was already in grad school with kids. And, uh, and he's like, what, like, what are you going to do when you actually have like, real world grown up problems? And you're not just undergrads with the uh, problems that come with that. Now, maybe he was being a little bit dismissive, but still. Like, and so, you know, I guess you can try meth. I hear that's great. <laughs> he was kidding, of course, and he also had tenure, so he can say those sorts of things. But don't, kids, don't try meth. It's, it's not great. Um, I grew up in Florida. Me too. There was a there was a meth house that exploded within hearing distance of my high school.
long day. There was so. one that exploded within my neighborhood. Nice, nice. Yeah, this was, uh, and this was in little cutesy little suburban Dunedin, North Pinellas. Not to, no, no trauma. It was, it was just a really loud explosion. We all heard it. Um, yeah, no, meth is not a good thing. Not, not a good, not a good drug. Um, unlike caffeine, that's spectacular. That's nice. This is legal. You're right. Um, yeah, that's that's a contributing factor. Um, anyway, anyway, I digress. Uh, the point being, though, is that that we can look at any seemingly insignificant action, me having a cup full of water in front of me, and we can we can examine it from a moral standpoint, because everything that we do consciously, deliberately, and freely can be morally evaluated. It has moral implications to it. In other words, it can be good, it can be bad, and it can be somewhere in between. It can be better or worse, in other words. So maybe me having a, a coffee cup full of water is good, but maybe it's not ideal. Right? Maybe I should have, like... Water. Yeah, maybe it would be better if I had something like filtered water that didn't taste vaguely of coffee because I put it in my coffee cup. <laughs> That's unpleasant, if nothing else, just ever so slightly. Maybe it would be better if I just actually took a bottle of water in my bag that I carry with me anywhere, everywhere, anyway. I can do that. What's that? Now you don't have plastic in your water. That's fair, I guess. I mean, I already do. This is a plastic drinking vessel. It's not lined with metal? I hate those. It gives a tinny taste to things. So especially hot drinks. Especially hot drinks. I Actually, that's... No, ew. I'm okay with, I'm okay with metal-lined uh, cold drink containers. But hot, no, no, I hate that. I actually had to search very hard to find, to find insulated drinking vessels that are all plastic. Oh, so I'm pretty sure that hard plastic doesn't wear as easily as... Oh, you're right, you're right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It, it is, yeah. It's far better, like, in terms of, you know, ingestion of microplastics, but... All right, back to the topic on the end. I mean, it's, again, it's, it's a factor to consider, I'm, and I'm not, I'm not even, like dismissing that or, or, or sort of saying that we should set it aside because that is a factor worth considering is, you know, health concerns due to what you happen to be doing in particular, that is morally significant. That is something that is, you know, worth considering in terms of what you choose to do in terms of actions. And so if you're examining, like what we just did, by the way, that was a case analysis of drinking water. Now, of course, you know, most of the case analyses we're probably going to be doing are going to be things that are more, you know, more significant, uh, at least more obviously morally significant than, than, you know, whether you fill your cup with water or not or something else. But regardless, that's an example of the kind of thing that, we will, that you guys will be doing for case analyses. You'll be looking through what are the morally significant factors to consider. What are the alternatives? Um, what could I have reasonably done? What obligations do I have? Am I fulfilling those obligations? Uh, what are my, do I have competing obligations, stuff like that. All right, what else? What else in here worth discussing? Any other questions as well? Anything else that I should clarify or we should look at in more detail? About what? Or like what you kind of like briefly mentioned, like uh, it was kind of just like in passing, but um, you mentioned like something about the like a double blindness. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you can't run. In in things like moral psychology, right, where where we study how it is that people make ethical choices. It's a very hard field to actually study. There are some philosophers and psychologists who do this, who actually study this empirically. But it's really hard to set up experiments for it ethically because you wind up setting up scenarios where you are, by necessity, trying to manipulate how people are going to interact with the situation. And if that is studying ethical decision making, then you're going to be setting up a scenario where people are, where you are manipulating certain people to act well and manipulating other people to do something wrong. And so when you wind up doing that, one, you have all sorts of psychological concerns to, to worry about. Like, 
what are the consequences of getting someone to do something morally heinous? Or at least what they perceive as morally heinous in the moment. And then also, how do you mitigate the consequences of that sort of thing? And like basically, how do you set up a scenario where, where you get someone to think that they are choosing something wrong, but the consequences are, are taken care of. They're not actually hurting anybody. You're not actually doing anything wrong. There's concerns about that. There's lots of concerns about that. Um, which is, uh, we'll talk about the Milgram experiments later in the semester, uh, which are one of the, one of the major uh, historical um, psychological experiments that studied moral decision making, and, uh, and especially things like um, deference to authority and crowd effects, stuff like that, um, which you could not replicate today. Not because it's not replicable in, in terms of like social science, like scientifically not replicable. It's just not replicable, not replicable because no ethics board in their right mind would let you replicate it. Because it involved like severely traumatizing dozens of people by making them think that they killed someone. Yeah, it's a hell of a case. It's, we'll, get to, we'll get to talking about the details of it. Um, but just suffice it to say that there are, there are, uh, there are real uh, significant dangers to, to empirical study of things like this, like setting up scientific experimentation for, uh, for ethical cases, which is why most philosophers are content with things like thought experiments. Setting up a hypothetical scenario or examining a scenario that naturally occurred and then trying to figure out, okay, well, well what can we learn from this hypothetical or what can we learn from this, this particular case that just sort of happened naturally that we didn't you know, make happen. Uh, which has significantly fewer, you know, ethical problems. Then answer, answer, answer the concern. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's look at a couple of ex his examples and see if we can figure out what what the hell he's talking about. So, what is uh, what is he getting at? What is he trying to prove with the carpet tax example? What's he trying to illustrate there? Moral obligation to stop somebody from making a mistake. No. no. What? No. No, no. Um, so setting up the scenario, and I'm not going to do it as well as he does, so just, just read it. It's on screen. But uh, the short version is, um, if you find somebody who, uh, if, if I am just going to read it. You know what? Screw it. I'm going to read it. Um, let's say you come upon me seated at table. Before me is a bowl of carpet tacks. I pour milk on them, sprinkle sugar over them, and bring a heaping spoonful towards my mouth. So what's going on here? So when you eat carpet tacks. Yeah, so little, little nails, basically. Yeah. Bad idea, right? Yeah. Like, for all sorts of reasons. So you stay my hand. Why are you eating carpet tacks, you reasonably inquire? I have been told I need more iron in my diet, say I. OK, so we have an end. We have a goal, of a, something that we are aiming towards by eating carpet tacks. You, in your role as tax assessor, explain to me that eating tax is not the way to achieve my goal. Your assumption is that I want more iron in my diet in order to restore or retain my health. Right? So the reason you might want iron in your diet is for health reasons. Right? You need, you need a certain amount of, of particular um, macronutrients, I think. I think iron is a macronutrient. Micro. Micro. Right, yeah. Thank you. Micronutrients, like iron. Um, things that help your body do the things that it does, right? Help the blood circulate, uh, circulate, um, uh, circulate oxygen, right? That's yeah, primary use for iron. Does. Yeah, yeah. So you know that's that's great. So if your doctor says you need more iron in your diet, cool. So what do you do about that? Well, naturally, you pour a bowl of carpet tacks and begin to eat them. Okay. The problem with this is that that is not the right way to achieve that end. The means that you have chosen misalign with the end you have in mind. You're not going to actually accomplish the goal of health by eating nails, right? You're going to fail. You're going to, in fact, make yourself unhealthy by doing so. And so, by, and so doing that is wrong. It's immoral. It's unethical. It's not just dumb, and it is, but it's more than that. Eating carpet tax is not eating healthy. What you're trying to do is eat healthy. And so by eating carpet tax, while trying to eat healthy, you're acting against yourself. You're acting in one way and acting in the opposite way simultaneously with the same action. 
And so what you're doing is contradictory. It's wrong. You're doing something wrong, in this case even, morally speaking. OK, so it goes on. Unquestioned in your homily would be that health is good and that iron is a constituent of health. The end is this less, thus left untouched by your criticism. So if somebody says, I need more iron in my diet, you're not going to say, well, why would you want to pursue, why would you want to eat a healthy diet? That's dumb. You're not going to criticize the end they have in mind. You're just going to criticize the means they have for achieving that end. But he goes on. Now, I might have responded to your question by saying that I wish to shuffle off this mortal coil. I've already read this part. Uh, and the internal hemorrhaging promised by the consumption of a bowl of carpet tax seems a good way to achieve my end. What then could you say? Because his point here is that the, that the means of achieving some end are not the only thing that we can morally criticize. We can also point out that you are aiming towards the wrong ends. That, no, you should not want your own slow and painful death. Or death at all, really. By acting in a certain way, um, you can have either the wrong means of achieving your end, or you might even have the wrong end in mind. Now, why he brings up this example and why he lays it out the way that he does is to bring up this distinction and to point out that we often have an easier time criticizing means rather than criticizing ends. We have a harder time saying that, no, you are aiming towards the wrong purpose rather than saying, no, what you're doing is not going to achieve the ends you have in mind. Uh, skipping ahead a little bit. The non-existence of the human agent can scarcely qualify as, a, as the good, perfection, or fulfillment of the human agent. What does he mean by that? And why is it significant? The non-existence of the human agent can scarcely qualify as the good, perfection, or fulfillment of the human agent. Is there anything akin to the sleepwalking example you gave us? How so? So like agent, for example, would be consciousness? Uh, age, an agent just means a person who acts. So acts consciously, deliberately, and freely. So, so what he's talking about is the, the, par, the so let me maybe translate. The non-existence of the person acting can scarcely qualify as the good perfection or fulfillment of that person. How's that? Rephrase help? Still don't get it. Maybe. Give it a shot. The non-existence of a person who is acting creates it where a human is not acting, therefore there is no end. Yeah, yeah, more or less, right? It's another one of these self-contradictory ends. Because when we pursue an end, why do we pursue it? To achieve a goal. Yeah, because we think it's a, well, not just to achieve the goal, but because we think it's a good goal to achieve, right? It's something worth pursuing. Why do we think it's worth pursuing? Well, because it is to go back up here, here a little bit. A human action is undertaken for a purpose, with an end in view. Its appraisal will take into account the means employed to achieve the end, uh, etc. Appraisal of an action bears on the end goal or purpose itself. That is, ends themselves can be assessed as good or bad. He says that every action, uh, every action is undertaken with a view to some end, and that the end has the character of the good. Uh, that is. Good here means something like perfective of or fulfilling of the agent. I want to do something, uh, I want something I do not have because having it is preferable to not having it. Hence, I pursue it. Latent in my action is the belief that its end is perfective or fulfilling of the agent, of me, of myself. I pursue things because I think it's going to improve me in some way. That's the only reason to do anything, is because I think it'll be good. Now, good here is perfective of me in particular, but me qua human being, human agent, as, and everything that involves. So that involves both me, myself, things that will benefit my, my body, mind, soul, et cetera, whatever. 
things that will therefore bring me, uh, bring me success, bring me happiness, bring me pleasure, bring me um, continued existence even. But then also, it is perfective and fulfilling insofar as I am a rational animal. In other words, insofar as I exist as the kind of thing that I am, that is, a creature capable of abstract thought and a creature capable of existing within a society. So Aristotle, from whom he gets a lot of this, saw human beings as having, uh, having three core characteristics. Animality, we are animals, we're physical beings, and so everything that comes along with that, right, our, continued, our continuance in being, etc. Rationality, which is the second part, which is our, our capability to rationally abstract universals from particulars. We can understand things in principle rather than just interacting with particular things. So rationality. And then finally, um, he understood us to be political, essentially political. Not political in the sort of modern legislative sense, but political in terms of existing as part of a community. And so part of our essential nature is our sort of integration within a broader community. And so what it is to be a good human being is to fulfill all of those things fully and properly. To be human is to be all of the good things that make animals good things, like to, to satisfy our, our, uh, our basic animal needs. Like nutrition, reproduction, locomotion, and sensation, the big, the big major ones. But then also to act rationally and to, to, uh, to continue our ability to be rational, and then also to find ourselves within and to act properly within the community in which we exist. And so this is where social ethics come in. Why we have obligations not only to ourselves but to each other is because part of me being me is my relationship to you. I would not exist as a human being alone. And Aristotle said that, um, that a, a human being without a polis, without a political community, is either a beast or a god. So the gods don't need us or each other. They can just exist on top of a mountain somewhere. Animals don't necessarily need other animals. You can have a, a lone hunter. That's fine. Human beings are essentially communal. If you're not communal, you're not acting fully like a human being. You're trying to be better, and you're going to fail, because you're not a god. You do actually need other people. Or you're going to degenerate into basically acting like an animal. So you need a, a real, genuine community. And part of being a good human being is, is being within uh, that community and, and contributing to it in some way and allowing it, along with yourself, to flourish. And so if you, you, have, you can have the wrong ends insofar as you fail to um, fail to act in such a way that will cause you and all constituent parts of your nature to flourish, to do well, to be fulfilled, and to, to, um, to, to be perfected. And so most notably, in this case, acting towards your own death is specifically not, not just not, it's specifically the opposite of perfecting or fulfilling yourself. You're ending yourself. And to act towards that is to act in such a way as to cut off the possibility of action. And so being self-destructive in this way is, is strictly irrational and is strictly, therefore, wrong, immoral, nonsensical even. And so we can criticize ends in this way. If you're pursuing an end that seems like a good thing, you, know, you might turn out to be wrong. You might pursue something that you think will benefit you, or you think might perfect you, or fulfill you in some way, but it might turn out not to. You ever regret a purchase? Like immediately even? You thought that it was a good thing to buy, right? Whatever it might be. And then you realized almost immediately, oh, this is a bad idea. I have no reason to have this thing, or I have no use for this, or I, or this isn't what I thought it was, or, uh, or opportunity costs suddenly make themselves painfully, painfully known that you know I could have spent this money on food, or if you spent too much money on food, maybe I could have spent this money on 
I don't know, something else. You can have things that you perceive as good and you pursue as if they are good, and they are good. There's no other way, there's no other reason to pursue something. But you might realize that they're not as good as you thought they were. They're not properly fulfilling. They're, they are, they're in some sense, lesser goods than you initially perceived or initially considered. Or it might just not be a good at all. You just thought it was. Because you misunderstood what you were aiming at. Right, so that's kind of what he's getting at here. Um, on which note, I mean, th there comes the question of why be good at all? Right? Why, why should I consider morality in, in my choices of action? Why shouldn't I just act for some impulse or act according to, uh, to desire or pleasure or pick your motivating factor? Well, because that's a good thing that you're aiming at, right? Because why else would you do anything? And so if you're going to uh, if you're going to act at all, if you can act in this human sort of way, in a conscious, deliberate, and free way, then what you're going to do is you're going to be pursuing certain ends. And by pursuing them, you are already agreeing, like in, just through your own actions, that these are good ends worth pursuing. And by choosing certain means in order to achieve those ends, what you are already sort of agreeing to, just implicitly agreeing to, is that those are means which are appropriate to pursue and appropriate to achieve those ends. So you're already trying to act morally, whenever you act. Even if you're saying, well, I'm not going to worry about doing the right thing. I'm just going to do what, what, I'm just going to do something that I stand to benefit from, or I'm going to just do something that, that seems right, or I'm going to do something that I want to do, or whatever. You're already saying by your actions that the end you have chosen is an end worth pursuing in its own, for its own sake. And maybe you're right and maybe you're wrong, but the, the question whether uh, the question of whether the, the particular end that you have chosen is a good end to pursue, that's a moral question. That's the question of ethics. So in other words, you always already are acting morally. The question was whether the question then arises whether you're doing so consciously or deliberately or carefully or whether you're actually paying attention. Right. So, think, uh, another analogy for this might be if you decide to play a game, right? A game or a sport or something. Why shouldn't you cheat? Why shouldn't you? Why should you not cheat? So what? So what, yes. Well, so what, though? I mean, really, there is a good reason why not to. Why not? Why shouldn't you? Maybe. Maybe you do. Maybe it's unfair to them. But, I mean, what if you don't? This still wouldn't be S1. That's a really good point. You're playing the game, right? What is a game? Not, not just that. There's more to it than that. that yeah, a game fundamentally is something, it's a fun activity, right? It's a, it's a leisurely pursuit. But with a set of rules, right? And those are agreed upon rules with everybody who plays. If you're not abiding by the rules, you're not playing the game, right? If you cheat in order to win, you're not winning the game, you're just not playing it. You're pretending to win the game. You're trying to convince people that you've won the game, even when you weren't playing it. So to play a game is simply by necessity not to cheat. If you are cheating, you're not playing. Ethics works in the same way, just on a much broader scale. Think of the game here as human action in general, being a human being, acting like humans do. If you're going to act like a human does, then, well, you're going to have to, you're going to necessarily want to do it well and do it properly and do it right. Any kind of action that you're going to pursue is necessarily going to be trying to do something right. It's just maybe you're wrong about that. Maybe you're going to pursue the wrong ends. But by pursuing ends at all, you are already intrinsically admitting that you're trying to pursue the right ends. 
And so the question is not, as he says, it's not like this is some, some alien imposition. Right? To act morally is simply to act. We're always already trying to act morally. And so we should, we should bring up the question of how should I act, not should I act in this, should I act well, because you're already trying to. You're just evaluating, in other words, to evaluate someone morally is to just evaluate them according to their own standards that they already admit to by acting. 